All right, guys, we're back at it again. As you can see, my background's a little different, but it's all about the you, man. I'll yeah, get doing so this thing. My... Yeah, man, you yeah, see no. it. You, know, hey, you yeah, got to no, get man. dressed up, man. You got to get yeah. dressed up when you got a good sponsor like Hainsway, man. And, and I got another piece, an article of clothing. All right, okay. I'm going to reveal a little later. Yeah, man, you know what I'm saying? got a whole fashion show planned. Yeah. Hey, guys, we got, a, we got a legendary guest coming up on the other side of this intro, sure. man. Larry Legend is what I call him. You should already know who that is. And it, it ain't Larry Bird, man. It's the Larry Legend that matters to us. <laughs> All right, guys, coming back right after this intro. Welcome to the You Heard Podcast. I'm hurt, dog. Ben and Joe break down all things Miami Hurricanes football. Don't ask me if I'm all right. Hell no. From hot topics to pre- and post-game analysis. What he said dominate, and we not doing it. You heard. I'm putting my heart in this dog. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who's been covering high school football across the country for 53 years. I did some research. I couldn't believe it. Five, five, three, guys. Five, three. It's in, I was. We were just having a conversation. This man knows everybody you've ever heard of and can give you a story about it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Larry Blue Blue Steve. How you doing, Thanks, Blue? guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Um, I was like two when I started, so I just wanted. Yeah, to- no, you must have. You must have like got. I feel like you went right from the stroller, just kind of went out to high school football field. Like, oh, that guy. That guy has that quick twitch movement, and you just yeah, started making yeah. notes. <laughs> yeah, the kid in the carriage next to me had the uh, great in, in the car seat. <laughs> you could tell his moves right away. So yeah, yeah he knew exactly. Like, oh, like I, like I needs to run a go instead of a hitch. So Blue, obviously, had to bring you on. First of all, thank you so much for coming on to the to the podcast. It's an honor. My pleasure. It really is. I like. My I told pleasure. Donald. I I remember. My, I would remember my drives home. It would be you and Donald talking about high school football recruiting and breaking it all down. I was like, how could this one guy know? Every single player, and this is before social media. Like yeah. that's what I'm, what, I, what I loved about your stories, and is that you always got gave us a little tidbit about each player, other than just what they did on the field. You tell right. us about their uncle, about their cousin, <laughs> and a little story about how they how they impacted it. What made you get started with all this, Blue? Well, my dad used to take me, you know, back in the '60s to all these big time games in in Miami, like. Miami High, Carl Gables, who kind of dominated the landscape. And, you know, I, I think the first real big game I remember was Carl Gables and Miami High. Miami High was number one in the nation, and Carl Gables was number two. So here, you know, because people think that, oh, well, the powers just started winning here in the 80s and the 90s and in the 2000s, but it wasn't always like that. Miami High carried football in the state of Florida for 25, 30 years, maybe even longer. Mm -hmm. They were the only game in town. They couldn't get games in South Florida or even in the state. So they had to go to South Carolina and Savannah, Georgia to play their games in New Jersey. And uh, they kind of like, you know, set the tone. And we went to that game. It was 1965 in the Orange Bowl. And I mean, they were talking about this game. There could be 70,000 or well, I'll tell you what, I we didn't believe it, you know. So my dad was one of those guys, oh, no, they're not going to, you know, we've been to big games. Well, mm-hmm. I remember going down to, to the Orange Bowl, and I said to my dad, I said, look at this traffic. This can't be for the game. This is, you know, they don't have traffic like this for the hurricane games, you know. So uh, <laughs> turned out they had uh, 52,500 people. They sold out of hot dogs in the first quarter, and um, – it was like my initiation into huge games. It was amazing. It was amazing because the following year I was in the orange bowl for a college game when Miami tied Notre Dame zero zero. And that was like that same atmosphere. And you say, wow, high school football. Um, yeah, that's how I got introduced to it. I would go to a lot of games. My sister went to, to high school and she, you know, she dated guys that we looked up to and, you know, and, and watched. And uh, and then I started getting into this in 1970 for real. A buddy of mine was trying to get a, um, a scholarship and I figured how come he can't get one i mean he runs the ball real well he's went over like 900 yards and dade county back then that was that was pretty good and um 
so what happened was, is I met somebody who uh, was at University of Tennessee, Martin. And I said, well, if I send this tape uh, of this kid, Donnell, to you, could you look at it or something? Mean, because back in the day, this wasn't any, you know, like uh, uh, a huddle video or yeah. these things were <laughs> man sized uh, uh, um, tape where they were real to real tape. And, and you guys are still too young. But back in the day when we were in high school or in middle school, the teacher would show us movies and it was on these 16th. Uh, millimeter reels and they would set it and put it on and leave and i'm thinking you know because they were like 45 minutes long so we got a tape i sent it to um tennessee martin kind of forgot about it um and then all of a sudden uh, my my buddy's mother calls up my mom and she says you know your your son should do this for a living and my mom didn't even know what she was talking about and she goes he sent our tape of uh, Donnell to Tennessee Chattanooga and we're going up there for a visit and they're going to offer him a scholarship. So ever since then, you know, I, I played baseball. So in between baseball and that, I, you know, I, I was, I always liked football, but baseball was always my sport. You know, I mean, I always, you know, I went to the first ever uh, New York Mets game uh, only by kind of default. Cause my, we were up in New York and my aunt and uncle uh, had tickets and my dad was supposed to go, but he got sick. And my uncle asked, you know, does anybody want to go to the game? And I kind of like, uh, you know, I'll go, I guess, you know, and ever since then I've been a com huge Met fan. And wow. um, so that's how I kind of got started in the sports, but football back in, you know, was because of my dad, my dad was huge into it. And, you know, he would take us to the legendary Carl Gables games. Back then Carl Gables dominated. They were like, 66 67 68 and in the 69 they were nationally rated i mean they had the one team in 67 they had five guys who went on to play in the nfl uh you know glenn cameron and uh ralph ortega both played uh, the ralph played for the dolphins later on cornelius colsey went to ohio state and then played with the raiders and played uh mitch berger um yeah i mean and then then uh, they also had a guy on the team um, who uh, was an Olympic gold medalist in the 800, uh, uh, Gerald Tinker. So uh, and he ended up going to Kansas State. So I had a chance to watch high school football at a high level. You know, people think it just arrived in the 80s and the 90s, but it didn't. It was always real good. You know, we had marquee guys down here for the longest time. And uh, that's how I got into it. And I stayed into it. Uh, September 18th, 1970 was the first game that I was ever paid to uh, cover for the Miami News, which was the afternoon paper at the time, uh, you know, before cable, because, you know, once cable came, all those afternoon papers were obsolete. Right. And, uh, you know, I had a chance to go to hurricane games back in the 60s. And, you know, I tell those stories and uh, somebody was just talking about the 1966 uh, season where Miami was eight, two and one. Uh, they beat back to back to back uh, number seven, Georgia, on a Saturday, on a Friday night. Miami used to play their games on Friday nights, um, which kind of made no sense because you didn't get the high school kids. High but school. back then, I didn't realize it. But they beat Georgia seven to six in a driving rainstorm. The next week, they beat USC, came in there number five at a 20 point favorite, and they beat USC. And then the following week, they beat a uh, 10 and two Indiana team. Wow. Uh, which it later played uh, USC in the uh, in the Rose Bowl the next year. So <clears throat> Miami, in in you know you look back at last year, and I was it's funny. I was just talking to one of the guys who covers the Canes today, and I says, you know, even back then when Miami was five and six or six and five or whatever, you know, not going to bowl games, their roster was better than they had last year. Last wow. year may have been the worst roster Miami's ever had, ever. Mm, uh, mm, and, ah, and people ah, don't realize. Talk about you know, so, yeah, so that – it gave me a chance, you know, <laughs> to see college football, you know, because back then they weren't really drawn very well. I mean, other than Notre Dame or Florida or Florida State. I mean, mm. back then and, – and they had crazy schedule. I mean, they would play USC, they play Alabama, they play Notre Dame, they play Florida, they play Florida State. 
Georgia Tech, Syracuse. They play some really good because back then, all these teams, Georgia Tech, Tulane, Miami, Florida State were all independent. They weren't yeah. in a uh, – and they, Miami used to play Navy and, yeah. and William and & Mary and NC State, although I think NC State was in the, the ACC at the time. But, uh, yeah, it was – you know, I one, a couple of years ago, I put up a, a old program, I think, from 67, and on the front they had the schedule. And people, all the people commenting, they go, oh, my God, they had to play that schedule these days. They get crushed. <laughs> you know, I mean, look at that. You know, they were playing – you know, I mean, in any given year, I mean, they were playing. They used to play Notre Dame and Alabama almost every year, and that, and then you add in Florida and Florida State. Those are four pretty damn good games right there. You know, and then mm-hmm. even back in the day, Georgia Tech had some guys, and Tulane had some pretty decent guys. So did Syracuse, and yeah. So that was my growing up period. I've f- done this fifty three years. I've never, as I tell people, I never gotten out of high school. Uh, I went right from high school into doing this. And uh, I went to, uh, um, even though I didn't cover Florida for three and a half years, I went to school at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So even that time I was out in uh, Nevada and covering football. And then I, and and then I went into it nationally and went to, I mean, I'll tell you guys, I, I went to see Canton McKinley and then Massillon. I saw some of the biggest uh, games, uh, banning in California playing, uh, against, uh, um, uh, modern day and Bishop Amat when they had, you know, they were loaded and, uh, yeah. And Servite when they had guys like, you know, some of the top players. So I got a chance to see that. I went to see Tuscaloosa central, uh, play against the Mat- uh, mountain brook when they had a guy, uh, major Ogilvy and, and that was great. And I yeah. did that for 17 years. I would get a chance to play, go like to Oklahoma and see Tulsa union against Tulsa, Washington or Jenks. And, and it was great. It just was so, uh, so exhausting because I would leave <laughs> here on a Thursday, wouldn't come yeah. back till Saturday. And I, cause I would watch the practices and, yeah. but then I started doing Florida solely, I think 91, 92. And I've been doing Florida from the Panhead. I take uh, trips now. See, I'm not like, I, I learned how to do this uh, without a computer, without a cell phone, uh, without mm-hmm. any, you know, any websites with no internet. So that's how I still approach things. And that's why I go to so many things live. I Last year, I went to 13 team camps. Uh, from Pensacola at West Florida to FSU and Florida and Miami and uh, FAU, FIU, USF, UCF, and even a lot of the NAIA schools like St. Thomas University. So I saw close to 6,000 kids last summer alone. And uh, and that's what I do. And, and so I get a little bit bitter at these guys who make assessments but don't leave their computer. You know, they rank the and, and a couple of weeks ago, someone was talking about that with like some of the, you know, the uh, fan websites like 247 and on three and some of those. I said, yeah, but you these kids are are being ranked by people who don't see kids and getting information from right. who don't see them either. Right. And, yeah. So how valid is that? You know, when you you know, and, and they go on, uh, you know, one cheats from another. You know, uh, uh, rivals will put out a list and 24 seven will look at their list. And, you know, and all they'll do is just mix them up. They've never seen the kids. Yeah. So that's, yeah. you know, I had an opportunity to go to IMG and saw Mauago and saw Riley Skinner and saw, you know, seen these kids over the last couple of years uh, to the point when, you know, when they get and they sign with Miami, I went and saw the kid of Gary up in Georgia. And I had an opportunity to, you know, before Mallory was, on anybody's map. I watched him. I went to Jacksonville and watched him in a couple of games. And I said, wow, that kid's going to be special. So that's the one thing and why I, you know, when you ask me, you know, about a kid that I could tell you, because I sat there and talked to him for like 25 or 30 minutes before a Mm -hmm. game and, you know, didn't just call him up, you know, like a lot of these guys will watch a film and then call somebody up. And then people think, wow, that guy's such an authority. And, but he didn't leave his desk, you know. I mean, how you know, to me, anybody anybody yeah. can see an athlete from film, but what about yeah. his character? And when yeah, I used yeah. to when I 
you know, college coaches, you know, uh, when when Jimbo Fisher and 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 uh, Tommy Tuberville were GAs, they used to call me up and ask me, "Hey, what do you think about this kid?" And and they know, I mean, you know, nowadays you could look at a film and say, "Oh, the kid's got, you know, he could play." But what is he doing? Teddy Bridgewater is a classic example. Uh, Teddy. I, Teddy played for me. I coached baseball, and Teddy uh, was my shortstop. And I still contend wow. to today that Teddy would be in the major leagues. If you know he didn't get sidetracked, Northwestern dropped baseball, so he went full football. But mm -hmm. I remember when he was a junior in in football, and he was out of the game. And I said to him, "I says, why are you sitting over here throwing rocks and stuff at, at you know, at, excuse me, at the cement?" when you should be having your quarterbacks together, I mean, your receivers together and your running backs and kind of going over things. And you know what? From that day on, I never saw him standing alone again. And it wasn't just me. I'm sure that, you know, his coaches back in the day, you know, were the same thing because you have to show more. And that's character. And that's something that you can't see from a film. I mean, you know, I mean, and that's why I admired people like Greg Schiano and uh, Jim Levitt. And, and uh, you know, back in the day when, when uh, college coaches could come out, you know, during spring, because they would come, and, and Mario Cristobal is the same way. They would go to a kickoff classic or jamboree, and they would be there at 5 o'clock and wouldn't leave till 11. And they talked to parents, and they talked to teammates, and they watched kids. And that's why they weren't fooled. There's a lot of coaches that won't do that. And then yeah. you get them on campus and all of a sudden, you know, that guy who ran a four, four and caught a hundred balls is a turd. You yeah. know, he's ruining the team. He's yeah. ruining the team because he's a cancer on the sideline. Yeah. He's going around, you know, after somebody gets chewed out a little bit, he goes, I ah, don't pay attention to that coach. He doesn't know what he's talking yeah, about. Yeah. And if you get those type of cancers, that could ruin a whole team. I don't care how many four fours you run. I don't care if you bench press 700 pounds. It doesn't matter. See, the, the game is all based on talent and character. And character is what a lot of these schools go on. And that's why when, you know, when people say to me a lot of, oh, well, I got a call from, you know, Nick Saban's assistant. Or I got a call from, you know, this guy or that guy. I says, yeah, they want to know character. They're not going to ask you about mm -hmm. if a kid could play. They right. can see that. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, that's Nick Saban became successful because he knows how to evaluate talent. Mm -hmm. But he also became successful because of the fact that he checked out a lot of these kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just because these kids were, you know, amazing football players, they weren't amazing people. You know, you, you're just probably hearing about some of the kids at Alabama over the last couple of years who've been kicked off the team. But if you mm -hmm. look in the first eight, nine, ten years of his career, that never happened, never you know, because they do their research. And, no. um, yeah, a lot of kids, are they bomb out. And so when I tell a coach, if he asks me about a kid and I don't – I say to him, listen, if I don't speak positive, positively on him, then I don't say anything. And I only mm. talk positive and then they kind of get, Oh, okay. Maybe Ooh. we got to do more research on this kid. Right. So I'm never going to sell a kid out. It's not fair. It's not fair to them. You know, I just tell them if, and I always tell a coach, if I don't have anything positive to say about a kid, I don't say it. I don't mm. talk about, it. you know, like if somebody asks me, Hey, what about the receiver? I go, yeah, you know, you got to check them out yourself and right. you'll see. So yeah. I don't want to be throw, throwing anybody under the bus because yeah. I know how valuable these college educations are and how expensive they are. And right. I don't want to be the guy, you know, I don't want to be that guy, but that's kind of people who deal with me have gotten to the point where they know, you know, they know if I tell them about a kid and I go on and on about them, you know, like the kid Hairston, there's a kid, the quarterback that Miami yeah. just offered who has mm -hmm. no division or power power five, or I don't even think he has a group of five offers. I've right. watched that kid for two years. The kid's a freak. I mean, mm -hmm. he makes every throw, throws the ball 79 yards in the air. He's on target. He can run a little bit. Ooh. And and that kid, and so when a, a coach will call me about him, you know, like somebody at UM did, and I said, dude, he should have been your first guy that you offered, but you guys <laughs> don't know that. And yeah. I, you know, to, at, I've been – 
The one thing that I've been real fortunate is I was close to people like Mario Cristobal because I've covered him since he was 14. And the same thing with Frank Ponce. Uh, Frank and I were real close and Frank would tell me everything. And he would ask me, you know, like, like the kid that they, um, uh, that they signed a quarterback this, this year, uh, you know, from up in Milton. Um, I saw him as a sophomore, right? I saw him as a sophomore at an FSU camp when, no, I was sitting there talking with Odell Hagens uh, from FSU, and I says he, I said, Coach, you know who this guy is? He goes, No, I don't. I said, Dang, I know he's in shorts and a t-shirt, but that son of a gun's making every throw possible. So I went over and introduced myself to him, and then I said, Wow. And from then on, I told Frank Ponce about him. Well, actually, Frank asked me, he goes, You know that? Kid? And I says, Yeah, I do. I said I was a kid that. You know, I that I actually really, and I don't ever say that, but I actually discovered him because nobody else even knew who the, who the heck he was. And then right. as soon as I'm, Frank was on him, FSU got on him, and mm-hmm. you know LSU. So yeah, yeah, that's what I like to do. And you can't see that you can't do what I do by sitting home and watching film. No, no. All no. right, Joe, what you got? Hope I wasn't yeah. too winded with you, but no, no, man. no. Oh, I love it, and I love. Yeah. Stories and everything. Bro. Yeah, we're here to soak that all in, Blue. We're, yeah. we're, even, we're all right, Joe. And I remember I, I was, you know, thinking back to when I had to make my little my VHS highlight tape and send it in the mail. No huddle. Had to send it big long vanilla envelope. Send it to everybody. You know. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Time. Now all you got to do is go on your computer and then uh, <laughs> send them that, and they get it within three minutes. Yep. You know, or less, you know, they get it right away. So that's, yeah, times have changed, but you know what, that's the one thing, you know, everyone said, well, you're, you're an OG. I said, but you know, I'm an OG because I've kept up with the times. I don't, you know, I don't go, Oh, wow. I can't use that computer. or I can't use this. I do. <laughs> I've kept up with the times, uh, you know, to the point where, I mean, I've got like two cell phones and I've got six emails and all this stuff because, and then I, you know, I mean, I, I try to get air, a lot of kids out, you know, I mean, I, last year I promoted close to 4,000 kids mm-hmm. and uh, my social media with all the things like 130,000 people. So if I put something out, a lot of people are going to see it and, you know, yeah. whether it's, you know, Instagram or my Twitter or my Facebook, people are going to see it. I try to, you know, make sure that I, like we have a small college fair coming up this uh, Saturday at, at St. Thomas university, orange bowls, putting it on. And I've been promoting the heck out of it because I believe in it. You know, mm-hmm. it's not just a, a fair where the college coaches and the high school coaches meet and show film, but it's actually a combine and they're going to have 50 mm-hmm. smaller schools around. And uh, that's how it's done. Cause anybody could tell you about a five star. Not many people could tell you about no stars. Oh yeah. Yeah. My, one of my, one of my friends, son goes to damn, Sun Lake in Tampa. Oh man. Like, I, how funny is that? Uh, I just got off the phone with BJ Hall, who's the head coach. They're looking for a game for spring, mm. and, and and a game. It's funny because he just took over the program, and I and I I put it out, and one of the teams that was like eight and two last year yeah. <laughs> texted me, said, "How about that?" And I says, "I don't know if that's going to be a fit. They were one and nine, but that's yeah, funny. They're that not good. Suddenly, yeah. yeah. BJ Hall, who used to be a quarterback, he's their new head coach, and." Even he texted me right before we go on. He goes, "We'll be there in a couple of years." It's it th- that area of the, of the state doesn't have a whole lot of talent. I want to. Did, no. did did you see anyone at Sun Lake that intrigued you at all? No, I saw him in a seven on seven last summer, and last uh, summer. they were. Yeah, why? Which position does he play? My son is Roger Jones. I mean, my son, my friend's son is Roger Jones Jr. He plays oh, basketball okay. and football. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll definitely safety. check him out. Yeah, he's like he's six four. About oh wow! Right now, wow. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's that's an area uh, that's the the uh, nature coast area, and and they mm-hmm. don't uh, they don't really produce a lot of kids. Although mm-hmm. Matt Breida, who was from San Francisco 49ers mm-hmm. and Dolphins, and a couple yeah. of that, now he came out of uh, Nature Coast High School. Okay, so, but not a lot. They, you know, they're north of Tampa. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of areas inside there. But, you know, they're starting to play better. But, yeah, Sun Lake, uh, I'll have to check them out. 
Yeah, he's definitely the best at like he'll pop oh, off. Dude. He's definitely I, best, the best athlete out there. Yeah, I watch um, him. He plays basketball. He averages like 20 points a game, you know, so. Um, but I was going to ask. So South Florida, obviously you've been covering South Florida, but you covered the whole country. Right. The talent, you know, everyone, oh, you know, the this, South this Florida, the best this, talent in the world, yeah. you know. Yeah. Has that has that gap? closed to you a little bit um well you know now, to me there's three areas of the country that are like this houston area definitely i mean i mean you look at the talent that they put out uh the teams that they have i think that they southern california area is a lot like this uh you know i mean and i mean when you take a look at at some of the area and i'll tell you another area that people don't realize but for the for the amount of residents that they have, New Orleans, mm, I mean, yeah. they're stacked, and yeah, you'd be surprised how many hotbeds there are. Detroit, yeah. Detroit had seventeen guys in the NFL last year. Mm. See, so oh, wow. yeah. yeah, and and you don't really figure it. I mean, a lot of them went to Cast Tech or yeah. you know Brother Rice or schools like that. But Florida, my South Florida. Um, it's just because of the weather's conducive. Uh, you know, they keep saying, oh, well, the coaching's not that great. And that's not necessarily true, but they're paid little. Uh, but it's a 24-7, 365 place. Yeah. You could do this every day. There's not every a snowstorm. Yeah. You know, there's not mm -hmm. going to be, you know, all that. And mm -hmm. and uh, that, I think that's why the South Florida area is always really, really good. And I think that the teams have become better. If you looked at the final rankings last year in the nation, uh, out of the top 10 teams, South Florida had four. Come on. Yeah, Where are you yeah. going to find that? Yeah. You know, just four, and then they had uh, a couple <clears throat> of others just right outside the top 10. But mm. when you look at a, a central, which is a public school, and people don't mm. realize, you know, you look at most of the schools, you know, in, in the country that are rated, they're all private schools. Yeah. The Matter yep. Days and the Boscos and the St. Thomas's and the Heritages and the Chaminades and, you know, schools like that. There are very few public schools. And so that's why what Central is doing and what Northwestern was doing uh, is amazing. Right. You know, I mean, yeah, they recruit, but you know what? That's every so does everybody else, especially down yep. here. Yes. But mm -hmm. to answer your question, South Florida is still a hotbed of talent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's going to be, we may not, uh, down here, we may not pr produce the quarterbacks that other areas do, uh, or perhaps, uh, you know, some of the, uh, maybe defensive linemen, but we certainly produce a lot of wide receivers and defensive Running backs, back. running backs like a Dalvin cook or Duke mm -hmm. Johnson's. And, you know, I mean, uh, uh, like Singletary, who's the, the starting running back at Buffalo and yeah. Cook, mm -hmm. who was his backup from down here. And, you know, I mean, you look mm -hmm. at a lot of the guys. I mean, I like watching NFL uh, because of the fact that you could turn on the, the tube and see a, a Ridley or a Tutu Atwell mm -hmm. or any of those guys like that or a Teddy Bridgewater uh, mm -hmm. that grew up down here. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, there's not a ton of other kids in the NFL that don't grow up, you know, that grow up in other areas. But it's South Florida is just it, the thing is, is and it's going to go in line with the Houston, Dallas area, the L.A. area. The youth football that's played down here is unmatched. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing from geez, from eight U all the way up into, you know, uh, the eighth graders. Mm -hmm. um, most of the places don't have um, uh, middle school programs, not in South mm -hmm. Florida. Um, yeah. So I think the youth program, so we have last year, there were three eighth graders that were amongst the best quarterbacks in the state of Florida. And they just came from youth football and started right on a varsity. Wow. And that's why we have wow. more freshmen every year incoming that will play. On major rosters, uh, last year American Heritage uh, uh, Plantation had uh, uh, Malachi Tony, who's undoubtedly one of the best wide receivers in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you look at guys like that, and you see the 26 kids from last year, and and they had Byron Lewis, who was a running back, and but those kids were 
14 and 15 year old ninth graders. Wow. So you don't see that a lot of places, yeah. you know, where you could get youth kids that'll come in and be little babies one year. And then all of a sudden carrying the load for some varsity team the next. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. That's, uh, that's crazy. Blue, let me ask you why that is interesting. Why is it that South Florida struggles to have, uh, like outstanding quarterbacks, like they develop wide receivers and skill position players? Probably not. You know, now it's changing. You have uh, mm -hmm. this Oliver Bozeman in, in, in this area. And now, um, you have Eric Cresser, who used to play quarterback of Florida, uh, Ken Mastroli. Now all them, uh, you know, they, and also here's a, I think there's a vital answer to that. All when you look at Jackson or some of them other kids that played quarterback down here, even Tyler Huntley, um, you take a look at the coaches are using them at quarterback when they really should be playing receiver. Yeah, when they're they the best athlete receiver. on the team. Yeah, yeah, they were the best athlete on the team. You know, it's not like in Texas or California when they, you got six five, two hundred twenty yeah. pound quarterbacks <laughs> who've been slinging it. Mm -hmm. You've got guys at a lot of these programs. Uh, that are the best athlete on the team. And you don't want to, you know, it's like Brandon Innes because yeah. uh, two years ago he had to play quarterback the whole year. Yeah. He yeah. wasn't a quarterback, but yeah. the kid ran a 4-4 and he was could play anywhere on the, on, the, on the field. And I always said that. That's the downfall of that is the fact that a lot of these quarterbacks are great athletes and they don't play that position at the next level. So, while other kids are going to elite 11 or using, you know, the, the t time to go quarterback training, these kids are out, you know, playing basketball or, mm -hmm. or, you know, they're not, re they're not working on their quarterback uh, skills. And there are some though, uh, we're, we're getting much, much better. Uh, but, you know, you look at the better quarterbacks at Miami over the years and, they're all from somewhere else. Gino Toretta, yeah. California. Vinny Testaverde from New York. Even yeah. Tyler Van Dyke's from Connecticut. So yeah. you look at those type of guys, you know, and very few. I could – Ryan Collins might be the only guy who grew up in the in the area. Wow. Um, same thing with Florida. You know, other than the kid that they had last year, they got kids from Texas and they get kids yeah. from, North, you know, from yeah. North Carolina. You know, you, you, you got guys in Florida State. You know, I mean, other yeah. than Travis this year, who actually was a, one of those athlete guys, he just developed yeah. into a quarterback. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, that's how it is. It's just, it's, I mean, you look at UCF, they had to go to Hawaii for two, two of their quarterbacks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, Hawaii, so, Hawaii is very special. I lived in Hawaii for five years. Yeah. Hawaii with their, with their quarterback development, that's like some no that's, it's like, this is what you're going to do. Like, you're yeah. either going to be a lineman or a quarterback. One yeah. of those two things. That's yeah, it. Either you got Hawaiian quarterbacks or Samoan linemen. So exactly, you know that's I mean? it. That's all it is. It's incredible, Joe. What you got, man? That's fantastic, man. That's a. That's um. That's wow. So you mentioned AJ Hairston, right? He's a he's a South Florida South yeah. Florida guy. Um, for twenty four, what? Give me a guy on offense and a guy on defense who Miami has to have like the Reuben Bain and the who was on offense. Well, I would say uh, Jeremiah Smith, you know, Fletcher from Chaminade, who I think is the number one receiver in the country, bar none. The kid's a freak. Yeah. I yeah. watched him. He's 6'3", 190, close to 200 now. I watched him last week win hurdles, you know what I mean? Like he was just toying with people. Yeah. But I think he's going to get caught up in that. Marquee Ohio. Well, now he's committed to Ohio State, but that's a long way. Yeah. I just think that he would be the guy I would say, you know what? They need to get him. They really he, need to get him for 24. Yeah. Um, you know, I could I could also point out, you know, a couple of kids, you know, that Miami needs to get, you know, from the Miami area in this next cycle because of the fact that, I mean, you got you got talent. You know, everywhere. I mean, St. Thomas has got Chance Robinson, who I think mm -hmm. is an excellent receiver. It's tough to pinpoint one guy, mm -hmm. you know, when because we try to do that, and then all of a sudden people bitch and moan that they don't get enough, but here they get the Washington brothers, and they get, yeah. you know, Ray yeah. Ray Joseph, and they get all these guys like that who are all Day County kids. Right. I think that they're not going to get any offensive linemen. 
from down here because yeah. I think that they're doing pretty well yeah. getting them nationally and yeah. using the IMG deal and using the fact that Mario Cristobal uh, is more of a national recruiter. Manny Diaz didn't really have that much in a way. I think uh, uh, the same thing with um, – and Randy Shannon was a Miami guy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and and also uh, – what's his name? Um, can't Golden. His name. Who? Golden. Golden. Uh, Golden. Golden. Who I actually ran into this year. It was funny. I, I, do I, said, I, went, to, I went to UNLV. <laughs> And and UNLV played Notre Dame this year, and I went to yeah. South Bend. Yeah. And yeah. as I'm coming out of the stadium uh, later, you know, after the game and seeing all the people that I knew, I'm walking. I go, Jesus, that looks like Al Gold. <laughs> it was. He was the coordinator for the Notre Dame this year. Notre Dame. And yeah. I, you know, I mean, yeah, um, yeah he his trouble and his problem was he was wanted to the tie, right? D'Onofrio. Yeah. He wanted to be everybody's buddy and uh, yeah. good guy, good coach. He just, he was a good coach. You can't do that. You can't no. do that. You can't no. see. That's why Mario Cristobal took all the time that he did because it would have been easy for him to start grabbing guys like Arroyo or somebody like that, yeah. that he knew, but he wanted to go on guys and, and people see, this is what I don't like about some of the, you know, the websites the and the media, they make okay. up stuff like, Oh no, they didn't even want to come here. And you know, it's not true. You know, like just because, you know, the whole thing about Charlie Partridge and Charlie's a friend of mine. And I covered Charlie when he was at plantation high school, he's a freak. And you just knew, I mean, Look at all the guys. He's going to have a first round draft pick this year in Kalijah Kansi out of Northwestern. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. JJ Watt. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> Jabal Sheard. I mean, mm-hmm. but the thing is, is that uh, Coach Narducey, who uh, at Pitt, who's another really good dude. I mean, I got to know him because on my radio show in the off season, we get those coaches on right. because they love to come on. And Narducey's been a favorite because his dad used to be a coach at University of Miami back in the day. And uh, yes. I got a picture of him and sent yeah. it to him and he loved it. But, you know, he knows that Charlie Partridge is too valuable. So mm-hmm. while Charlie was never offered a job at Miami, I think that there was a rumor going around and all of a sudden he got a salary doubled. Yeah. And, he's, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and I think that's happened with Jawan Sider too at Penn State. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. when they were talking about running back coaches, yeah. come on, he got the top two freshman running backs in the nation last year. Yeah. Those two kids were studs. Yeah, and then yeah. he came down here and got the kid Mac from, you know, at uh, St. Thomas. And, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't think, I mean, he was in the list, but he was never offered a job. And I think that, you know, Franklin got a hold of that. And now the guy's yeah, making right. close to a million dollars. Wow. Um, yeah. and, and, but when you get a guy like Timmy Harris, um, even though he didn't have the hoopla that everybody else does, you have to tend to think that this is a, a guy that Mario will be in line with. That he's a tireless worker, comes from a family. His brother Brandon played for Miami. Now he's coaching at FAU. Yep. His yep. dad, Ice, uh, yep. was just, you know, an Legend. icon. Yeah. But yep. what Legend. he learned, which <clears throat> Charlie Strong never exhibited, and I was really surprised because I know Charlie. Charlie acted like he's n- never been a head coach before. Because he didn't follow that work ethic and he didn't understand what Mario was doing, you know, Mm. but Timmy Harris being around it all his life will come in here and understand that if Mario's in here at four 30 in the morning, he'll be right there with him. If he's there at 1230 at night or in the next morning, he'll be right there with him. And that's the thing. Sometimes you sacrifice. I thought he needed one year, maybe left at UCF uh, to, uh, really be given authority. Last year, Malzahn gave him, you know, your co-offensive coordinator, but he never let him call a play. A play yeah. and, you know, wow. so, uh, yeah. but Timmy's always worked real well when he was at, at uh, FIU, uh, you know, the same thing. So I think he's going to do real well. I think he's one of those guys that the kids are going to respect. Um, the The quarterback room at my, I mean, the running back room at Miami has got a potential over the next two years to be one of the best in the country. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got all those studs, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. I mean, you, you yeah. look at somebody like a Fletcher who's a big 10 back yeah. and he was for a minute, yeah. you know, with Ohio yeah. state. I mean, wait, you see him, he's going to be, unfortunately with that Franklin wasn't. 
And I known Thad Franklin, I guess, since the day he was born. His yeah. dad went to Hallandale. They grew up in, you know, not far from where I live. Uh, but he just didn't want to work hard. And every time I saw Kevin Smith last year at a game, I go, how come you're not using that? And he said to me, he goes, are you at practice every day? And I said, no. He goes, well, let's keep it that way. So that's why I kind of mm. knew Ooh. that he wasn't, you know, Ooh. that he, he wasn't going to work out. But, he did walk out at practice, yeah. Yeah, that's there's crazy. another thing. You don't, you don't do that. Yeah. I don't care how angry you are. You bite your yeah. tongue till it bleeds. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't do that because you don't set a good example. You're, and that's okay, guys. That's what I'm getting back to. You, you a character, you yeah. can't see character on a film. And yeah. that's probably one of the things that may, Miami may have overlooked when getting him. I think that, you know, they were just happy to land somebody like that who was a big back. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but with, uh, when you take a look at, at somebody, you know, the, even Chris Johnson. Mm -hmm. Chris Johnson mm -hmm. could be the fastest running back in the country. Yeah. yeah. And he probably will be. Well. Mm -hmm. He just has to learn mm -hmm. to run from the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. His He's more effective now as somebody's in space. Like you look okay. back at the Central game last year when he scored on the 68-yard run. Uh you look back on the game against St. Thomas when he had that 59-yard run and, and the game against um, uh, Shamanad Madonna when he scored on the very first play of the game on a yeah. uh, on a swing pass. Yeah. There were never runs from the line of scrimmage. They were mm -hmm. all him being in space and them getting him the ball, which mm -hmm. is nice. Uh, and, and it's good to know that he could – you know, he could do that for Miami. He just has to develop. You look at somebody, he needs to watch what Parrish does. Because Parrish is a guy that weighs 170, 175. But you seldom see uh, Parrish try to bounce things outside. He always tries to run tackle to tackle. You know, I mean, because of the fact that even though he's light, he's got great vision. And you look at most running backs who are – you know, like the Chris Johnsons of the world, although I think he may be the exception. But you just can't bounce everything outside. Now, when you have a 6'3", 240-pound linebacker running in a 4'3", four, four, four yeah. range, yeah. they'll catch yeah. you up. And uh, so, you know, and, 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 and the other kid is Citizen. Let me tell you something. Miami stole him because he could have yeah. gone anywhere. Yeah. 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 He got hurt, and maybe that was an omen, you know, that in the offseason he knew he had to work harder. So he's coming back off of that. And Cheney, if Cheney could only stay healthy, that That's, dude is such a freak. Of nature. Wait, man. Oh, he made man. a high jump 7-2. Come on. You know, I mean. But that is, that's the if. That's the if there, right? I know, it's but, the, you know, it's like Tua. We all hope. Yeah. yeah. People talk yeah. the same way about Tua. You yeah. know, in the in the seven weeks that he was healthy, he was amongst the best quarterbacks in the <laughs> NFL. I mean, yeah. he's thrown for 370 and five touchdowns and six. But yeah, you're right. He's got to stay healthy. He's, you know, he's injury prone, but that's, that's part of the game. You know, he's just got to, and it's not like him. He's not in the best shape because yeah. he goes into the weight room and, you know, he's, he's always in great shape, but I think that, you know, guys like that, uh, Miami has to, you know, with Dawson coming aboard, very good, very innovative guy, but you can't run that that wide open offense when you don't have a reliable receiver on the outside. And Miami doesn't. I mean, no. Caleb Young was on and off. The only receiver that really was consistent, and that was Restrepo, but he was out for five weeks. Yeah. So they come in, Caleb Young was too inconsistent. But that's why it's essential on their last hire for in the offense to get a receiving coach yeah. that maybe is a little bit older. You know, not so young. Maybe you know. I hear the the the, uh, court, uh, the oh. uh, one of the coaches from the the Ravens. Uh, it was one of the yeah. guys, that, yeah, yeah. Some, um, that yeah. was in the mix. Yeah. To me, that way you come in and you got experience and you might see things. Because mm -hmm. to me, I watched Redding play in high school, and I thought he would be the dude. I mean, you know, he's a really good uh, kid. He's he and Restrepo have the highest GPAs on the on the mm -hmm. on the team, mm -hmm. um, but that you come in now, and I I think that they're gonna what's gonna have to happen is they're gonna have to move Riley Skinner outside. They really will. I mean, he's gonna be a mismatch. 
you know, he's he's earmarked to be a tight end, but oh, Jaleel Skinner. Oh, Jaleel Jaleel Skinner. Skinner. Okay, okay. Or Riley Williams. Riley Williams. Sorry, or Riley Williams. Yeah, yeah, Williams. yeah. Riley. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. All these names, but Jaleel Skinner. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. Not, definitely. Definitely. Got four six five speed. Yeah. Uh, he's a wide. You know, so I think he'll get a lot of looks at that receiver position because you've got some pretty good tight ends, and then mm-hmm. a lot of those younger tight ends that are coming in, like you mentioned. You know, and then and then you got a royal back, and you still got Mamorelli, and you know, I mean, you got some dudes. Um, offensive line, I'm not really worried about because I think that, you know, I mean, they've added the depth. I mean, do they have front line kids? We'll see. You know, Mawago and Okunlolo, they're probably a year away from really being a force, but they're gonna be forced into. Yeah. action this year they really did well with their recruiting of offensive linemen yeah. um, will it show up this year not really thinking that but it probably over the next two years Miami will have an opportunity to be as as good as anybody and that'll be a focal point yeah. you know on the offense and then we know at quarterback uh the if, if uh, van dyke doesn't have a good year Miami won't have a good year yeah. it's just the way it is i mean yeah. Yeah, they it. don't have another quarterback that uh, is of that caliber yeah. I mean, you know, they got promising guys, but they, um, but that's, you know, the, and, and I think Dawson's going to do well because he's not going to be afraid to use his backs. Mm-hmm. You know, his running back last year had a thousand yards and he had a hundred catches, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. at Houston. So I think that's essential. And then obviously with Gidry on the defensive side, he's fits in that mode where he's a worker. And, you know, I went to every home game Miami had last year and, it was weird that the only guy that was a raw, raw coach from start to finish was a head coach. You need all these other coaches on that staff, mm. you know, jumping around and being, you know, being animated and being into the game. And yeah. I think, you know, you could, you could see when Gidry was at Western Kentucky, they ran that film of him yeah. and yeah. boy, he got into their butts a little bit. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. and That's yeah. what you need. And, uh, yeah. but I, they're thin up front linebacker way thin uh, which will be remedied over the next couple of years. Um, and their secondary is good, but not great. So, you know, I mean, you got to remember, um, they gave up 40 to- 40 uh, points six times last year. Mm. That's, yeah, you ain't winning many games like that. <laughs> Joe, what you got? No, you are not. No, 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 Do you no. think um, with the offense, so um, – Offensive coordinator, new the new coordinator, Dawson. Awesome, yeah. If he shows, you know, we got the air raid coming in, and hopefully his his pass air raid air raid adjacent. I think air raid this year. Hopefully yeah, his, yeah. his pass concepts yeah, yeah. mesh with Coach Cristobal's running, you know, power running concepts. Um, but do you think if we show on offense that we can, you know, throw the ball around? That Jeremiah Smith may reconsider. Yeah, well, anything could happen. You know, look, Miami got the uh, arguably the probably the one and two linemen in the nation, the offensive linemen in the nation last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, They've got you know guys like um, Ray Ray, uh, you know uh, Joseph, a guy like that who could have played anywhere. I mean, he was committed to Clemson for a while. So, I mean, you know, so Miami's done well there. I'm not ruling it out. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Josiah Trader has been looking yeah. in Miami's direction, yeah. and he's a guy who, you know, he's probably the second or third best receiver in the state, right, um, right behind Jeremiah Smith, maybe a, a couple of other guys upstate that, that have shown. But, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to rule it out, Joe, you know, that uh, uh, that they that they could get him. But, you know, the thing is, is um, – you could put it on any offense you want and do anything you want, but if the guys don't catch the ball, what good is it? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like I said, you could bench press 550 pounds, but if you can't block, you know, what good are you? So they've got to, they, for his offense to work, they've got to catch the ball. Oh, yeah. And they dropped so many last year. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, they, in the Texas A&M game, that cost them the game yeah. when you look back at it. I mean, yeah. that probably was Van Dyke's best game. And they lost. Yeah. He was on target all the time. Yeah. So you can't have that. Um, and if you remember in mostly all these games, Miami could never run because they were stacking the box because mm-hmm. they didn't believe their passing game could beat you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you don't want that to happen. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer is if guys start going up the field a little bit and catching the ball, Miami will start exploding because then your linebackers are back off. Your safeties aren't taking steps up yeah. instead mm-hmm. of taking steps back. Uh, your corners are showing more respect, uh, you know, for your receivers. So it all changes if, if you could catch the ball. Yeah. And, and that'll make the running game more effective. Because oh, yeah. Miami tried to force the running game last year. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they, you look back at the Florida State game, and you, man, Florida State had eight guys in the box to start the play, and they walk up to two linebackers and a safety. So you probably yeah. had everybody in the damn, no one was back. Yeah. No one was back. Do nothing. You didn't yeah. have to talk about that game. You didn't have to bring that. No, I'm just saying. That's <laughs> an, but you know what? To bring up what's Ooh. wrong, you got to isolate the games that, you know, even Middle Tennessee State. Yeah. I mean, same the thing. same thing. They were doing things, and I watched them later on in the season. They were horrible. Terrible. Yeah. Bad. They were just horrible. Awful. So, awful. Yeah. So, so, I mean, that's what I'm saying. But look, there's you, you mentioned something earlier uh that Joe kind of grimaced about and I kind of smirked. The 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 talent, right? It's it's an argument that has the chicken or the egg conversation basically on, on Kane's Twitter. Now I'm a person who didn't didn't believe Miami had enough or very good talent last year. Just because if the injury to one player can decimate you to that level, you clearly don't have talent or depth. Right. How bad? How bad was it last year? As and what was it a failure just on the other? I don't just want to gonna have the question. Was it the coaches? Was it just a complete and utter disconnect? Because last year felt like the Avengers of coaches, right? Like they just got all these big names together. This year it feels like they got the workers, the one that goes. No, no, we're just gonna put in the work. You got they got the two New Orleans guys, right? Dawson and Gidry. New Orleans, you said, is a huge hotbed. So you see the targeted hires that Mario did. But back to the first question, how bad was it last year? Because for us to watch it was it was basically like if one thing went wrong, the entire team fell apart, which showed a lack of character across the board for me. Just call it calling it what it is. Well, Ben, I could I could tell you this. I mean, last May um, during spring football, uh, the high school spring football. You know, I, Mario always, you know, because I was in the hospital last year, I had that COVID. Yeah. So yeah. when I got out, he says, I got to see you, man. I got to see you. You got to drop by. You got to drop by because I didn't go. I went to the spring game, but right. I stayed. I sat in the stands actually with Joaquin Gonzalez's brother. Oh, wow. <laughs> I could tell That's you awesome. that was. That was a little bit uh, crazy, those guys. You yeah, get, he was you get five guy. Cubans together, and that's a little crazy. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> That's too loud. That's but, too loud. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, is uh, the thing that uh, when I finally got a chance to go down and talk with Mario, <clears> and, you know, we were you – know, Coach Fell was in there for a minute, you know, and because they had some guys he was working out. And he said to me, he goes, what do you think's wrong? I said, well, mm. I think the, the – or what had, What do you think has been wrong? And I says, they're getting kids, but they're not coaching them up. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, look right at me, he goes, that's not going to happen here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you look at last year, the coaches like you said, he had the marquee kids. Those coaches never coached those kids up. Mm-hmm. They never developed. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, with the exception of Maribal, who does a nice job. I'm not – you know, he does – but who else? Who else did anything last year? Linebackers suck. Charlie yep. Strong didn't do anything. And I can't say anything bad because I like him, you know, as a person. He did nothing. Um, I don't think they developed on the defensive line. Leonard Taylor was the same guy as he was the year before, just a year mm-hmm. older. Um, you look at the receivers, come on. What'd they do? Yeah. But drop balls. No. So, and, and, I mean, obviously a die and those guys, I mean, they did what they could because probably that was like one of the more, you know, the, probably the more developed part, but they never did that. And and when I hear uh, somebody say, let's hire him, he's a good recruiter. That's so overrated. Yeah. That's so overrated. Mm. Recruiting takes care of itself when you win. Yes. Yeah. Give me a guy yes. that's going to teach you yeah. and give me a guy that's going to develop you and raise the bar. And if you win 10 games, look at Coach Fritz at Tulane. That dude's 
USC's. Come on, they beat USC. Yeah. He he yeah. has guys on that staff, and he added another one with Gidry, but he didn't make it there. Uh, yeah. But guys, a coach, guys that elevate. Recruiting takes care of itself. Yep. I mean, look at Alabama. They don't need real good recruiters. Ohio no. State doesn't, you know, need real good recruiters. Georgia, they don't because everything takes care of itself when you win. Yep. Miami mm-hmm. needs teachers. They yep. need guys like Tim Tim Harris. Uh, they need guys that could, you know, like Dawson, who's going to be yep. working with the quarterbacks. Yes. Um, and that's why I think that the higher – at wide receiver coach is going to be very pivotal Mm -hmm. because right now that's a, that's a position that's lagging behind for a number of reasons. And, you know, unlike when if you remember when Tracy Howard and, and uh, Duke Johnson came true freshman at a start. You don't want that. No, no, you don't want that. You want them to ease their way into the mix, learn a little bit from some of the juniors or seniors or whatever you have. So that's why, you know, thrusting, you know, the the offensive linemen. And I'm sure a lot of the freshmen are going to get some opportunities because it's just they need that from a depth standpoint. But don't put five freshmen out there and expect to win. You're just not going to. You know, Mm -hmm. potentially they're probably better football players, you know, than what they had. But from an experience standpoint, you know, you look at like Mauagoa, you put him out there from day one, some defensive tackle crush him. Yeah. That's a senior. That's a 24 year old, 23 year old. (laughs) With COVID, you might be 28. Whatever it is. Yeah. The COVID year. Yeah. Uh, So by, but by maybe, middle of the end of the season he'll have enough confidence he'll be watching film he'll he'll have a spring and he'll have a summer underneath his belt he'll you know be going up against Leonard Taylor's and he'll be going up against I think the guy who probably has a chance to make the most impact right away would be Bain because Bain's one of those old souls that yes yes yeah he fits into the scheme I think uh, that he would be really good you know not a not a off the bat starter but he's going to be pushing for playing time because you just mm-hmm. need guys like that um i think that's a guy that you got to watch from the beginning um uh the linebacker from orlando jones uh, again what's his name um uh money bryant because bryant. Bryant. of his size yeah. uh, because of experience he'll get a lot of early looks offensively i think that what they're going to settle into is they're going to use your strap as your kick returner and along with maybe Bobby Washington and use mm-hmm. Ray Ray as your punt returner. There, there, there's a Kobe George experiment's got to be over. If you want that kid to be a receiver, yeah. make him a receiver. Yeah. Don't put him yeah. in as a punt returner. Yeah, he, he should not should not be back there anymore. No, he shouldn't. Yeah. And, no. you know, and, and I followed Jacoby since he was in ninth grade at Plantation and he was a punter. He was a punt returner. He's a kick returner. He's a DB. He was a wide receiver. He's always, when there's too much on anybody's plate. So you look at Restrepo, smart mm-hmm. enough, good dude. He and Bobby Washington should be your, uh, Robbie Washington should be your kick returners. Uh, both of them could fly or at least make, especially Robbie. But with Restrepo, he's going to get the ball for you and he's going to go a little. You know, mm-hmm. and then maybe Chris Johnson, because he's a guy, if he breaks the wedge, shit, nobody in this him. world is going to catch him. Mm-hmm. Um, but Washington's pretty damn quick himself. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think you're going to look at Ray Ray, unless Brashard gets his stuff together and be is more consistent, I think Ray Ray could supplant him early on. Because he's not – the receiver coach, your offensive coordinator, and Mario are not going to put up with mediocrity. They're just not. No. That's why I said with uh, a guy like Skinner, they may have him out there one day, and all of a sudden he's running a sl- you know running out of the uh, out wide out position, and he's killing people. They go, we got our receiver. I don't care no. who else says they're receivers, but he's catching. Well, and that's why yeah. Caleb was real good at the beginning, because he was making some really nice catches. But then he kind of tailed off, and excuse me, Kobe Young became a. Another dude, you know, the, of what they already had. Yeah. Joe? I'm intrigued. You mentioned linebackers. I'm intrigued by Marcellus Pulliam 
and Bobby Washington. Um, yeah. What kind of roles do you see for them coming up? Pulliam's going to get in there because he's he's a he's a player. I mean, no doubt. Uh, he's got great instincts. He reads plays real well. Um, great vision. You know, like Wesley, you know, in a lot of ways, too. Wesley does a lot of those things. Wesley's way athletic. I mean, the first time I saw him as a ninth grader, he was standing under a basket and dunked the ball without running. Mm -hmm. So I figure, oh, geez, guys got spring. <laughs> uh, Washington, now he's, I mean, I, I ate crow with him because uh, Charlie Strong and I were watching him mm -hmm. uh, during the spring when they played for Killian. Wow. And uh, they had, mm -hmm. um, uh, what's his name? The uh, the kid that uh, went to Central. He's at Louisville now. Uh, the Stan Miami Clark. Yeah, yeah. Stan, Stan Clark. Clark. And I wanted him. Oh my god. Yeah, Stan Quan Clark and him played together at Killian. Mm -hmm. They were both linebackers. Mm -hmm. And I said to Charlie, I says, "Look at the difference. Stan Quan knows where he's going." And I said, "You know what? That's you know what that's doing part two. He was a safety." And Derek Gibson mm -hmm. worked with him, and uh, he he and then he got bigger, and he plays like a safety, but he's a linebacker. Ah, I said the thing about Washington is he overran plays. He just, but I'll tell you. And then I kept saying, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of questioning why Miami took him. But then I saw him twice during the year. <laughs> he killed people. Yeah. And I said, you know what? There's a kid. At, I mean, you talk about a guy that just completely turned things around. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's just maybe I saw him on a bad day, mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe somebody got in his ear and started, you know, watching film and teaching him how to read a little bit better, you know, get key, you know, his keys weren't real good. And, but after that day, when they were playing that day, uh, I don't think a real good team it was a, it was a spring jamboree. Uh, but uh, Stan Kwan had, in those two halves had 20 tackles, two strips, one for a touchdown. And Oof. Washington did nothing. So I, that's why I said, you know, I mean, you, you got to watch these guys live and you got to watch them over again yeah. to, to before you make assessments on them. Yeah. As far as touching on what, what Joe said before we go to our uh, our ad, um, we're linebacker coach. We have the, Derek Nicholson, right? Which was the guy that was at Louisville that recruited yeah, Stan Florida State Louisville. guy, yeah, Florida State guy. What 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 do you know about him and his uh, ability to teach? Because recruiting's out the window, like you said, winning cures all. What it what? How does he teach? How what have you heard about him as far as teaching? Really good. I mean, everywhere he's been, uh, you know, the the linebackers have gotten better. Plays the game, played the game real hard, and I remember him when he played. But uh, yeah, no, I think he's. He's another one of those additions, you know, that's going to teach and that's just going to mm -hmm. elevate and not just be a guy there. Uh, he's going to, you know, and he's going to be demanded uh, that way with Gidry, who, you know, coached linebackers and defensive backs himself. So he kind of had a, you know, a, a read on it. And Nicholson's a, you know, a good guy and he's a hard worker. But, you know, being a good guy and a hard worker doesn't mean anything unless you could teach and Yep. That's what he's going to do, and I think he's a was just an outstanding addition. Okay. All right, guys, let's get into this uh, ad from our sponsor. Welcome to Canesware. Family-owned and operated since 2010, Canesware has all the latest merchandise for the Miami Hurricanes, Miami Dolphins, Inter-Miami Soccer, and more. Come visit us at our store in Davie on University Drive, just south of I-595, or online at Canesware.com. Canesware, the spot Miami fan shop. Hey, man, look. That's this right. Is what, episode, episode three, you see, you see the garb. You see it. They send out great merch for us. You see Joe with the flag. You see sure, he, got that flag. <laughs> yeah, he's got that flag. Hey, man, Canesware believes in us. this weekend, this past weekend, too. Hey, real quick. Baseball looking you, hat. That's right. Yeah, that, baseball, old, yep. that old English M. Hey, listen, I uh Joe, I told you it was gonna be tough for me to find a hat. That snapback did not happen. At not all the, at all, son. It's it sits up oh, like a yarmulke. I can't oh. do it. It's just <laughs> it's just not a good look. My wife goes, Don't you dare put the hat on camera. <laughs> Don't you dare put that hat on. But look, man, thanks to Brett and everybody. We have we have two two ten dollar gift cards that we're giving out. If you put the code, what's the code word, Joe? 
You came Sebastian. up with Sebastian. Yeah. So in the comments, guys, That's make sure word. you guys yeah, put Sebastian, leave your review. You know, we're talking to blue. So Sebastian is the key word. And then make sure you sign up for Kane's Wear Rewards and make sure you're part of their membership so you can get right. the you can get the ten dollar gift card at checkout. All right, let's get back to this recruiting. Because shout out to Kingsworth. Thank you very much, guys. Blue. All right. <clears throat> my, I, I got one more question. Yes. Well, actually, I'm going to probably have 10 more questions if we are <laughs> honest about it. Because you're, you're a library of, of. So there was a player that. I can come on, on again, guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, your door is always open, Blue. Yes. Um, there was a player that one of our listeners uh, mentioned, and we talked about it in the, in the, in the pre before we started recording. Wade and Charles out of uh, out of what was it Palm Beach, the Palm Beach area? Yeah, Su Somerset Canyons in Boynton Beach. Yeah, you. I, I just mentioned, and you already went off a story. How? Yeah. That, first of all, that was incredible. And huh. what can you tell? What can you tell us about him? Because he's a what a twenty six kid, right? Yeah, he's a young kid. I mean, you know, he's yeah. uh, uh, you know, he's he's an well, he's I think he's a twenty five kid. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Uh, but uh, there's a guy who, like you, we talked before, 6'3", 185 mm -hmm. pounds, a track kid, an athlete. Uh, they list him as, you know, I mean, uh, when I watched him, I saw him play wide receiver. Uh, last year he had 50-plus receptions. He went over 1,000 yards. And that was during, uh, you know, last year during his sophomore year. Um, and then on defense, um, he, had, he picked three balls off. He had – Oh, geez. I'd say about 60 tackles. Um, wow. Yeah. Phenomenal kid. Um, big time. Uh, you know, we, we wonder how long he's going to stay there, but I, uh, I think, you know, they, they treat him right. He treats them right. He's getting a good education. And I always say to, to the kids who want to transfer all the time, it's not where you start out. It's where you end up. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right, Joe, last one. Wait you Charles, There's your guy, Wade and Charles. Wade and Charles. Um, as far as Miami, um, do you see, do you foresee any more staff changes as far as moving people off the field, on the field? I'm hearing Jason Taylor, you know, perhaps move on the field, getting DVD on the field. Are you, do you think any of that is going to happen or could you see well, that? Well, it ha it depends what happens with the die. If he's gets a, I know that he's looking, I guess, you know, in the NFL and, mm -hmm. you know, there's been some feelers, but, you know, I mean, I'm just of the belief that you got to get this staff together. You know, oh, I mean, easy. to yeah. me, Jason Taylor is an, is a no brainer. And come on. No. I mean, no. they, you know, people go, oh, well, listen, I saw him as a defensive coordinator for four years for St. Thomas. Yeah. And he really was, the coordinator. I mean, he yeah. and he hates losing. And he he yeah. turned Nick Benito. I always remember yeah. Nick Benito in one game yeah. into somebody special. Went to Oklahoma. He's with Denver Broncos now. And yeah. if you if you know Nick Benito, here's a guy who's a great athlete. He was the number one basketball player in the nation as a seventh and eighth grader. Mm, and then wow. he went to U school and played football. Uh, you know, as an eighth grader and started in the varsity and then. You know, so and he taught him uh, a swim move in the Bosco game that year. The kid was relentless. You know, that's why Dallas uh, went to um, St. Thomas for his last year. Mm -hmm. And now he starts for Alabama. Yeah. I mean, you know, because of the fact that he's an impact coach. And yeah. I, would, I was saying, what's taking so long? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, you know, there's a chance. I think that, I mean, DVD's done a great job, and I think he's really, really good. But I would put Roland Smith on the field before. Roland mm. Smith, a UM guy, played in the Dolphins, uh, mm. eight state champions, two national champions. He's developed kids all the time. And I just think he's too valuable to be, you know, a guy It's just an on-campus dude. Mm. I mean, he, mm. he did extremely well, you know, for – uh, you know, teaching and coaching. Um, so, I, you know, not to take anything away from DVD, and he's definitely earned it. Yeah. And if he gets it, I love the kid. You know, I followed mm -hmm. him at pace and all that. But right. I just think that they – and I told Mario this last year, I'd like to see, you know, give, give Roland Smith a chance. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy knows stuff. I mean, you know, yeah. he played the game, and he was a 
yeah. you know, big time corner. And but I don't see any, you know. I mean, they talk about fields, but yeah, I don't think so. Maybe if they if the tight ends don't get their stuff together next year, maybe. But yeah. uh, but he's done a good job, uh, you know. Yep. I don't see anybody else. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, but I I would like to see first and foremost. I'd like to see Jason Taylor be on that staff. Yeah. You know, as an yeah, active, yeah. right? Yeah. I feel like there's going to be a little log jam in the secondary because the D coach Gidry is a secondary guy. You know, he coaches DBs. So, you know, what is that? Nick mean? Saban's a secondary guy too. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> imagine being their cornerback or safety coach. Oh, yeah. that must be miserable. That must be miserable. <laughs> Those, he just hey, breaks down film. Make you step up your game. The, Blue, thank you so much for your time, man. We really appreciate it. Uh, Till next time, guys. Remember, it's always all about the you. We're out of here, guys. Thanks, Blue. Appreciate you, Blue.